All right, friends, thanks for joining us today. We are wrestling with the question of can we trust the Bible as being reliable? We're going to look at questions like we've heard from many skeptics that the disciples would not have remembered the apostles when they wrote down the Gospels and the books in the New Testament. We're going to look at where the Gospels anonymous. We're going to look at contradictions, even look at the character of the Old Testament God. So whether you are a Christian or a skeptic, I think you're going to find today's conversation very helpful. My guest today, Dr. Bill Mounts, has written a book that I think is fantastic. It's called Why I Trust the Bible. It's a popular level book. But Bill, as you know, I've compiled books like Evidence and Demands a Verdict with my father and probed into these a lot. And mm-hmm. a lot of this I knew because I've researched this topic, but there were a number of times I paused. I was like, that's a really fresh, helpful insight. So I think your book and this interview will be interesting to scholars who've looked at this, but also to lay people trying to make sense of whether they can trust the Bible. So, Bill, thanks for coming on and for writing an excellent book. Thank you. Thank you. You pointed out an interesting issue, and that is I try to write it doing academic background work, but write it for 17 year olds who are freshmen in the university Mm. and then their parents who are sitting there watching their kids walk away from the faith. So it really had to hit both those two age groups and how to deal with the real issues and real answers. So it was a, it was a, it was a fun book to write, but a bit of a challenge. Well, we're going to jump into some of those challenges, but in case our audience is not familiar with you, what training do you bring to this question that maybe gives you a unique angle to whether or not we should trust the Bible? Well, one is I did a PhD in Aberdeen uh, in Scotland under Howard Marshall, and Daryl Bach and Craig Blomberg were two of my best friends, and you'll see their names all the way through the book. And so not only did I get professionally trained, but I had I've got a really great, you know, great network of friends that I've been able to bounce ideas off and, and work mm. with. The, I was the New Testament chair of the ESV, and I'm currently on the CBT, which controls the text of the NIV. So especially when it comes to translation work or just Greek work in general, it's been, uh, it's been interesting to be able to have uh, a really two different experiences working with the text. Uh, as you know, most of my work has been done in biblical Greek textbooks and references books. So I get really comfortable when I'm in issues of text criticism and, and the text itself. Well, that was actually my favorite part of your book. And we're going to get to that as you describe the difference between the Alexandrian, the Western, kind of these Byzantine lines of text. We're going to come to that because it raises the question, why is there an Acts tradition that's about 8.5% longer than another Uh, kind of Mm -hmm. manuscripts we have. We're going to get into that. But before we specifically get to the Gospels, I thought your opening chapter was excellent because there's a lot of people who question just the existence of Jesus and who question what we can know of Jesus outside of the Scriptures. Now, as soon as somebody says, what do you know of Jesus outside of the Bible? I immediately say, even if we had no evidence outside of the Bible, I still think we have good reason to trust the New Testament text and tradition itself. But set that aside, you have this list where you list about 14 things. You don't necessarily have to read all of them, but when we look in Mm -hmm. kind of the first and the second century, what are some of the facts that you think are most significant about the life of Jesus we can know completely apart from the New Testament? Yeah, it's quite, it's on page seven. It's, it's, uh, I had 14 things. Um, Mm -hmm. Jesus was a Jew who lived in the first century. Uh, People actually believed that he was born out of wedlock which kind of gets at the virgin birth, at least Mm. their version of it. Uh, Conflict with the Jewish authorities. Some people thought he was the Messiah, uh, crucified under Pontius Pilate, um, was hung according to one Jewish tradition, Mm. and they believed that he was raised from the dead. So, I mean, that's just some of the highlights, but there actually is quite a bit of information you can gain. And what's remarkable too about this, Sean, is Jesus was a relatively, during his life, a relatively Mm. unimportant person who lived in an incredibly unimportant place in the Roman Empire. And that we know anything about him from outside Mm. sources is quite remarkable. But then you've got the two references in Josephus, you have four uh, Roman historians, you have two Greek historians, and so early writers. And so there actually is a lot of evidence that how Jewish Jesus mythicism is called ever got started is a bit of a mystery to me. 
I mean, who, who, wh why would we think that the single most important person in the history of the world, whether you're a Christian or not, it, you, I don't think you can argue that point, um, that he didn't exist. Yeah, I agree. From the New Testament writers, which is a number of different books, to the early Christians, to the non-Christians, mm -hmm. Greek and Jewish and Roman, the evidence is just too compelling minimally to doubt that he existed. And this list also mm -hmm. includes, like from Josephus, that Jesus had a brother, James, right. some of his right. other family details. I mean, what we know about him is significant, and especially because his ministry was probably two to three years. He had no right. political power, right. no military position. I actually think it's remarkable what we do have. Now, no. one of the criticisms that's come up lately, this seems to be a lot of skeptical discussion is about memory. And there's been some mm -hmm. good studies that have shown over time, memory <clears throat> changes. We forget things. We remember what we want to forget what we don't. Mm -hmm. This seems yeah. to be a fair, good challenge to the Gospels written yeah. minimally decades after the events themselves. So right. why should we believe, number one, that their memory is reliable and not this constructive memory filling in just what they want to have Jesus have said and believed? Yeah, I think for people like us who don't live in an oral culture, it, it is a hard to get our minds around this and to really understand it. But an oral culture, which Jesus lived in, is a culture that passes on its truth by word of mouth. And so there's a totally different mindset when it comes to memory. And all you have to do is look at some of the historical references we have. It was common for Greek school children to memorize the entire Iliad and Odyssey. That's 200,000 words. Mm. Uh, it wasn't uncommon for Jewish rabbis to memorize the entire Hebrew scripture. That's a lot more than 200,000. I mean, I have a friend that's memorized, uh, in his case, the RSV word for word. He knows it perfectly. He also memorized the Greek New Testament word for word perfectly. And we look at that and go, that's just a freak of nature. But it's not that when you live in a culture that passes on traditions, on teachings, uh, theology stories, by word of mouth, God made our brains a lot more capable than I think we understand they are, we, we who don't live in an oral culture. So, yeah, so it's, it's amazing. You know, the, the normal comparison, Sean, is the telephone game. And Bart Ehrman likes right. to make this that people right. do. And I discuss this in the book, but it's like, it's a totally fallacious comparison. Because in a in a telephone game, you have 15 people lined up and person one says something to person two, you know, and you get down to the 15th person and it's nothing right. like what the first person said. But that's nothing like what, how oral tradition works. Is that first of all, it wasn't private, it was public. There were checks and balances. This is group memorizing and passing it on to other members who form their groups and pass it on. There's, uh, there's just, there's many ways in which the oral culture of Jesus' century uh, is totally unlike the uh, telephone game. And certainly maybe one of the most important is that what's at stake. I mean, in the telephone game, you almost want to make a mistake because it's kind of funny. Right, right. But, <laughs> but their lives depended upon an accurate, recitation of the actions and the teachings of Jesus. So there's everything at stake. Mm -hmm. And while I may not remember everything I've learned about the Holocaust, I'll bet you if your dad or mom were Jews at Auschwitz, I'll bet you remember the details really, really well. Mm -hmm. One of the points that you bring up that I've heard Craig Blomberg make as well is that the way yeah. Jesus taught lent itself to being remembered. Right. I mean, stories, studies show that when you speak, people later remember, I think it's within 24 hours, like maybe 10% of what you said on a yeah. good 24 hour period. But what they remember yeah. are the stories. So yeah. Jesus it's, tell, go ahead. No, it's just, yes, stories are transcultural. I think that's one reason Jesus did it, but also they're, they're much easy, mm -hmm. they're much easier to remember. Yeah, Craig's done a tremendous amount of work in this, and I really uh, appreciate his book and point people to it all the time. But the whole Talmudic form of teaching was repetition. Repeat, mm. repeat, repeat, repeat. And it's not like, you know, when I teach New Testament survey, I say something once and I expect the students to remember it because they're writing it down. Okay, that's a non-oral culture. But Jesus, it's you repeat it over and over and over and over again. And you can make slight alterations. I, I don't think that the Sermon on the Mount, Matthew, and the Sermon on the um, 
plane in Luke are the same thing, even though they're very similar. Because, you know, once you kind of figure out the beatitude structure, you can, it's a good thing to use. It's a good thing to repeat. And so why not say blessed are the blessed are the blessed mm. are that? But there'd be slight changes. But the point is, there's all this repetition going on. And it just really helps people memorize. Craig also, I don't think I put this in the book, but Craig also had a really good point. I, I'm not sure if I read it or if he said it to me, but it was like, there were no distractions for them. I mean, they listened, to, they, a, great point. a little Jewish boy and girl, okay, you, you're gonna get it in school. You're gonna get it at the home. You're gonna learn by reading uh, the Bible. Uh, there's no texting. There's you know no video games, mm. I mean, their whole life was defined by uh, the Hebrew scriptures, if you were a, a Jewish kid. And so you just learned to memorize and learn, and you heard it over and over and over again. I think that is part of why I trust oral tradition in the New Testament as well. And the other reason, and you're not going to convince a skeptic with this, but I think it's reassuring to a Christian is that Jesus promised that the Holy Spirit would help mm. the disciples remember everything he did and said. Mm. So that's not going to sway a Bart Ehrman. Okay, I understand that. But for me, to know that there was a supernatural element in the process of the go of the Gospels being written, that's a big deal for me. So mm. I appreciate that. You know, I, I'm a professor at Biola Talbot, you know, but I also travel and speak. And if I find a story that works, I use it over and over mm -hmm. again. And arguably, maybe too many times if I love a certain story. <laughs> Jesus was an yeah. itinerant preacher with a different audience. So it makes perfect sense that he would tell the same stories over and over again, reinforcing it in the minds of his apostles. Yeah. When it comes to Gospels, the big one that comes up is that they're anonymous. And hence, we yeah. can't trust them. Now, technically... They are anonymous. They didn't say the gospel according mm -hmm. to Matthew at the top like our modern day Bibles do. Mm -hmm. One way is to say, even if they're anonymous, it doesn't mean we throw the testimony out. And I think something could be said to that. Mm -hmm. But you think we have very good reason to believe yeah. that the gospels attributed to Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John were written by Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Why? Yeah, and I am really thankful for the work of Martin Hengel and Craig Evans, because they are doing, and Simon Gathergall, because they're really doing some good work in this area. Um, it is true that the Gospels do not have the author's name embedded into the text, like hmm. Paul puts his name in the letters. Okay, that, that's, that's for sure. But that doesn't mean they're anonymous. And what Craig Evans has done is he's looked at all the early manuscripts of the Gospels where we actually have the first part. And in every single case, he says, the author's name is there. Matthew, Mark, Luke, or John. Mm. So actually, I would probably rephrase what you said earlier. We, we do have the names mm. attached to the Gospels mm. when we have the first part of the ancient mm. manuscript. Uh, and Simon has a little more technical argument, but that's basically what he's getting at. Mm. You know, the, the work of Martin Hengel, though, I think is, is just as important. And he points out that the ancient testimony to the authorship of the Gospels is unanimous. The only name ever attached to the first Gospel is Matthew. The only name ever attached to the second is Mark. And when you look at the incredibly rapid rise of Christianity through the ancient world, how, how did that happen? How did mm. the people in one area of the world and another area of the world come up with the same name? Well, there has to have been very early and very strong traditions that Matthew wrote the gospel, then Mark and Luke and John. And so even if the names aren't embedded, the fact that the there no other name is attached to the first gospel but Matthew. Hmm. There has to be a reason for that. And I, I think it has to do the church knew early on uh, very easily that who, who the authors were. And then that, that goes along, though, with Papias's and the other early church fathers that clearly stated who wrote the four gospels. And Papias, of course, is writing in the early part of the second century. So this is the generation afterwards yeah. and is very, very early. I've always found it fascinating that if, and you make this point, that if the early church is going to invent certain authors and attribute them mm -hmm. to the books, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John are not the most likely names. Matthew, yeah. a tax collector, would raise certain right. questions. Uh, Mark, according to Papias, as you indicate, is writing mm -hmm. the memoirs of Peter. So why not call it the gospel according right. to Peter? It seems that they right. care about getting it right 
that Mark yeah. penned it. Luke was not one of the apostles and admits in the start of his book that he's not an eyewitness. Maybe John, but even the Gospel of John doesn't explicitly identify which John right. it is, and we have to kind of piece it together. So you see these apocryphal Gospels showing up later. Gospel of Peter, right? That makes mm-hmm. sense. Gospel of Philip, Gospel of Thomas. Mm-hmm. If you're going to invent them, that seems to be who you would pick. That seems to just add the corroborative case that these were written by the people whose names are attributed to them. Yeah, and, and it also indicates how important authorship was to the early church. Uh, mm-hmm. In my commentary on the pastorals, I had to spend pages and pages on the whole issue of pseudepigraphy and how uh, the argument is made that, well, the early church didn't really care who wrote these letters. And there's just not a shred of physical evidence that that's the case. And that every evidence that we have when uh, the church knew that a book was not written by the person who claimed to have written it, they threw it out. You know, Mm. 3rd Corinthians and the letter to the Laodiceans. I mean, they're chuck as soon as the church fathers realized that they weren't written by the people who they they claimed to be. And, but, you know, sometimes the argument is couched in slightly different terms. And they'll say things like, well, the, they weren't really interested in 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 the authorship. Well, I guess that's the same question. But and <laughs> Mark, Mark is, I was going to say it differently, but it just came out that way. Mark is a great example. Everybody knew because of Papias and other people's uh, instructions that Mark was writing the memoirs of Peter, however you want to translate that difficult word. Uh, this was Peter's recollection and Mark was writing it down. I think Mark wrote it down because I think Peter actually wrote Second Peter in his terrible Greek, mm-hmm. and Peter didn't want to write his own gospel, and I, presumably Mark is better at Greek. But anyway, that's a side note. The, the fact that everyone knew the second gospel was written really by Peter, but they called it the gospel of Mark. Why? Because they thought it was really important to attach mm-hmm. the right name to these gospels. So mm-hmm. I think authorship was— cr- the authorship was tied into the credibility. Did they get it right? Were the authors in a place to know the right information? Uh, and it also comes in the issue of canonicity well as well. So I think the mm-hmm. authorship is a really important thing. Another uh, challenge that often comes up to the reliability Bible is the seeming difference in message between Jesus and between Paul. And yeah. sometimes when you read it on the surface, it does seem like they're saying different things that are yeah. either a different message or arguably, as we're going to come back to when it comes to the nature of salvation, some would say Jesus at times teaches a works-based salvation, yeah. and Paul is clearly teaching a you know grace-based salvation. Why yeah. do you not think that Paul invented Christianity and that overall— Paul's message is consistent with the message of Jesus. Um, Several reasons. I tell the story in the book about a good friend of mine who basically said, Jesus, I need to believe, but I don't have to believe Paul. Hmm. Um, And I point out, well, you know, how do we know about Jesus? Oh, the apostles. Who was Paul? He was an apostle. So are Hmm. you going to pick and choose apostles? I mean, you can't really do that. Um, But her issue was that Paul felt harsh. And so I guess there's two levels. There, there's a perception level and then actually what they say that uh, for them, they felt that Paul sounded harsh and Jesus sounded mm. loving. And so, well, you need to go read Matthew 24 if you think Jesus was always loving. I mean, he called the Pharisees walking defilements, you know, whitewashed mm. tombs. I mean, Jesus can really be harsh on people in, in one of the earlier chapters of John, the, the, the disciples, the people who thought they were their disciples said that, um, you know, they fell away and Jesus says, well, they weren't one of my sheep. Mm. <laughs> you know, that's pretty harsh. I couldn't get away saying that from the pulpit when I was preaching. <laughs> and, and frankly, you, you look at some of the discussions of love, who can separate us from the love of Christ and from love of God in Christ Jesus in Romans eight, you know, nothing can. And so it's it's a matter of emphasis. It's not a it's not an issue of whether one was loving and one was harsh, and I think the answer is they're they're writing for different audiences for different purposes. Jesus' life was about the inbreaking of the kingdom of God, and the conquering of the kingdom of Satan, and pushing to Jerusalem to die 
for our sins and then be raised again. And so he's ushering in the kingdom of God and trying to talk about entering the kingdom of God. You know, unless your righteousness exceeds that of the scribes and Pharisees, you won't even enter the kingdom of God or kingdom of heaven. Um, Paul was trying to deal with specific churches and specific issues, and he had his own vocabulary. And so you have different settings, different purposes. And so they're going to express their truths differently, but they're not incompatible. And Craig, in one of his chapters in his book, The Big Thick One, does a really good job of spelling out mm. where we think that this is a real difference, but it's really not. I mean, uh, blessed are the poor in spirit is justification by faith. Hmm. I mean, I, I think when you look at what those two phrases mean, they're exactly the same thing. We come to Christ by recognizing that we have nothing in our hands we bring, but to your cross we cling, as the old hymn says it. And that means it's an issue of faith and not of works because our hands are empty. So I think that the the differences uh, on the first surface are on the surface are more a sense of the words they use and who they're talking to. But at the, at the essence, I just don't see a difference. Hmm. I think it's interesting that both, you know, Jesus' words are recorded in the gospels, which is one kind of genre. Paul's mm -hmm. are in letters, which is another kind of genre. Right. And, and of that's course, a good answer too. of course, the words of Jesus are still during the time of the old covenant, anticipating his death that will complete it. Paul's mm -hmm. is minimally decades afterwards, trying to make sense of what this means for the local church. Right. So there's really right. some significant differences we have to keep in mind. We can also ask the question, did the early church feel free to change the words of Jesus to fit Paul. And I think you make yeah. a great point that there were so many controversies in the early church that if they wanted to settle, they could just right. invent, well, Jesus said A, B, or C, and they don't, which right. tells right. me that they had some commitment to what Jesus actually said, and they knew the wider community would call them on that if they start invented <laughs> sayings of Jesus. Yeah, the the whole issue of circumcision would have gone away if if uh, mm. Matthew said, you know, don't you remember? And I'm I'm really Jewish, so I'm the one that's going to say this. You know, don't you remember Jesus said that circumcision is of no avail? I mean, it would you're right. It's been so simple for them to make up uh, something to deal with the issue. Uh, Peter, didn't you remember Jesus said that it's okay for you to eat with Gentiles? You know, Galatians, Acts. Um, so easy to solve mm. problems, but they didn't do it time and time again. They didn't do it. And then the, the flip side of that is that they kept embarrassing statements and, and, you know, and I, mm. you're going to go out and do your ministry and I'm going to return be, you know, before everything is done. And he doesn't, um, to the head of the Jerusalem church, he calls him Satan and tells him to get behind him. And there's all kinds of these missing and embarrassing. And, you know, unless you, you have to hit your mother and father, if you're going to yeah. follow me. And, and there's a lot of these kinds of things yep. that if they weren't really interested in what Jesus actually said and did, they would not be in the Bible, but they're there because the writers thought it was important to be historically accurate. Like eat my flesh and drink my blood almost sounds pagan. You know, I mean, there's all these times where P Peter's like, uh, should I stay? Should I go? Like, Jesus, yeah. like I have always yeah. thought that's a really a fair point. Now, a big objection that comes up and in my own journey, you know, growing up in Christian home with a father who was and is an yeah. apologist. I went through a period of questioning. And I remember the first time I got online, yeah. this is mid nineties and found this list of dozens of apparent contradictions right and it really unsettled me at that point i was mm -hmm. probably 19 years old and was like oh my goodness there's contradictions all over the place now, i want your broad approach to contradictions but there's a couple points that i make i'd say one if there were contradictions in the bible that could be established mm -hmm. this would not make me cease to be a christian what would right. undermine the faith is if jesus was not risen as paul says in first corinthians 15. So if there really were contradictions, we'd say we got to revisit what we mean by the Bible being inspired and or inerrant. We have mm -hmm. to rethink if we got the right books, but we could still know Jesus rose to the grave and have confidence in these stories, right? even if there were contradictions. That's point one, because I want to put the main thing where the main thing is. But second, a difference is not a contradiction. I studied philosophy, right. so I studied logic. And mm 
one reporting one angel, the other gospel reporting two, isn't a contradiction. A right. contradiction is when you affirm and deny the same principle, referring mm -hmm. to the same place and the same time. So same place, same time, it is raining and it is not raining. Those mm -hmm. are not reconcilable contradictions. So those are two right. things I point out. Would you add anything generally as you look at the claim <laughs> of contradictions before we probe into a couple particular ones? Well, I mean, one would be an example, you know, can you, can you trust Bill Mounts's Greek textbook? And if in the textbook he says Columbus in 1493, Columbus sailed the ocean blue. Okay. I'm off by a year. Right. Um, <laughs> okay. at, at one point you go, okay, Mounts was wrong, but that doesn't mean his whole approach to teaching Greek is wrong. And so, you know, what I've learned from people like Howard Marshall and some of the Brits that have really high views of scriptures, but are not inerrantists is that they can trust the Bible, even though they think this got it, this one got it wrong and that one yeah. got it wrong. So you're right. It's, it would be a major issue that would have to say, uh, if they can't get that right historically, then uh, I'm not sure I can trust anything they say. So, yeah. um, I, yeah, I think that that's a valid point. Um, your question was about what other things would, I think if there were a lot of contradictions, mm. that would bother me. And uh, because, okay. you know, the, the old argument that if they can't, if they keep making historical mistakes time after time after time, then they haven't done their homework or they're not trustworthy or something like that. I remember going, uh, I got a really good friend whose sons walked away from the faith had researched it heavily and referred to a website that had like 200 contradictions in the Bible. So to help my friend, I, I went and read them. Every one of them was a misunderstanding of the text. Interesting. He said, this verse says this, and this verse says this, and, and they're contradicting. Well, that's because you misinterpreted the verse. And it was, it was really obvious things. And mm. I thought, no, you know, but that's, you know, what's out there and all these lists of changes. And so, I mean, part of the answer is simply say, have you interpreted the verses properly? Mm. And uh, the vast majority, I know the other thing I wanted to say, uh, and I, I say in the book is that whenever I'm approached with the topic of, I can't trust the Bible because of the contradictions, I always start by saying, well, could you give me the one that bothers you the most? Hmm. And let's talk about it. Well, I've never had anyone give me the one that's bothering them the most because so far they don't know the problems. There are hmm. problem passages, but the vast, my experience is the vast majority of people don't know what those problems are. Hmm. And so that's how, when you're talking to someone about uh, apparent contradictions, you always start by saying, can you, can you give me the one that bothers you the most? Because that'll tell you whether they're, that's the real question or if the real question is, you know, behind that smoke screen and, you know, they just don't want to accept the Lordship of Christ. And so they're hmm. just going to say, well, I don't trust the Bible because it's full of errors. Oh, I've heard it's full of errors. Um, but I don't want to believe it. So I'm going to believe that it's full of errors. I, that's a very common thing to happen. I think you're right that how charitable or not charitable we are to the text and apparent contradictions can shape our motivations going to it. Now, the sword can cut both ways. I've read the Quran, I've read the Book of Mormon, and I've found contradictions therein. And I've also noticed in myself, I'm like, oh, I can explain away the Bible ones, but I accept those of other texts. <laughs> and it's yeah. forced me to go, okay, am I being consistent here and being charitable yeah. across and not picking and choosing? I think Christians need to ask themselves this honestly as well. Now, let's just look at two big ones that come up. I remember back okay. in high school, I was having a, friend, a conversation with a friend, a Mormon, a member of the church and Jesus Christ, Latter-day Saints. And he was pushing more towards a work salvation. I was talking about salvation by grace. And I said, look, Paul mm -hmm. says it's by grace, not by works in Romans. And he goes, well, what about James? James also yeah. refers to Abraham and says, nope, it's not by uh, faith alone. It's by works. Is there a contradiction here? Um, I'm, I'm my, my memory, not living in oral culture, is faulty. Does James actually say it's not by faith? Mm, I, I'm not... I, 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 think I think you're think right. You, I, you're absolutely yeah, I right. Think that you I think created a little more of a, of attention. Yeah. You know, right. There's different ways. There's different ways to handle it. Uh, I just, I like the simple answer that, 
Uh, the word justification can refer to how you come into a relationship with Christ. And the word can also refer to how do you live in a relationship with Christ as one who is justified, as one who has been declared righteous. And in that case, they're talking about two different things. I, you know, we all know that what's frustrating is that both authors use the same verse in Genesis, the same illustration of Abraham to prove what appear to be contradictory things. But yep. You know, and I don't know if James is trying to correct Paul. I, I'm not sure that's the uh, the right way to approach the book of James. But James is, in his context, is hitting the whole issue of the necessity of sanctification of lordship pretty hard. And to people who perhaps had heard Paul's talk, he doesn't want them to misunderstand Paul. And so he chooses this illustration to say there's more going on in justification than simply coming to faith. It's how you live. In fact, how you live shows whether you actually were justified to begin with. So that's mm. that's a classic example of an interpretive issue, but it's one that, you know, Martin Luther did not want James in the canon because of that particular yeah. uh, verse and that particular misunderstanding. I've generally approached it looking at Paul is talking about our justification before God vertically, what salvation oh. means. And mm -hmm. James is talking about our justification horizontally before people who don't know our hearts, but see our works. It's mm -hmm. justification, but in a different fashion. I think that's a piece of it that I might throw in there with the distinction as well. But you're right. There's no clear cut contradiction, although there's a difference in their audience and their focus and even the theological right. point that they're making. What about, let's get yeah. uh, back to the Gospels. The timing of the Last Supper seems like yeah. there's a contradiction between the yeah. synoptics and between John. And at least on the surface, this is a pretty good challenge that I've heard uh, frequently raised. Right. But you don't buy right. it. Why not? Well, first of all, it, it would be, uh, how could they make a mistake? <laughs> You're in the most pivotal night well, maybe other than the night after the resurrection, you know, the most pivotal night of their entire lives. And to make a mistake that bad would, I don't know who would make that kind of mistake. I think the answer is you work backwards. Both, all four gospels, uh, John and the synoptics agree that Jesus died on Friday. Okay. So regardless of what the meal was or the timing on the meal, if you follow through in the chronologies, they have him dying on Friday to get him off the cross before the three stars come out the evening of our Friday, the beginning of Shabbat. And they want, they, it's an issue of cultic cleanliness. They wanted to, to get him down. So when you work back and, and then you take the fact that in both, in, in all four, it's so obviously a Passover meal that is be really weird if they were two different meals one day apart. Uh, the, the trouble has to do with the, the timing of the eating the Passover. And for John, it's really easy to see that as a reference, not to the Passover meal itself, but to the second most important meal of the Passover week, which was the next day. And I, I give the specifics in the book. And so you're talking about the why the Jews wanted to get the, uh, body, Jesus' body down from the cross. But again, I, I go back to the fact that it's obviously the same meal, and it's obviously on Thursday night because he dies on Friday afternoon. So whatever that meal is that the Pharisees wanted to go to in John, it's it's not the meal that Jesus just had. Mm. So, so they... I just think... No, I think working backwards from Friday afternoon, they have to be the same meal and the timing is the same. So focusing on, on what they get right and where they agree, work backwards, they're talking about a different meal is yeah, the, the simple, the, the, quick answer. Okay. Right, All right. right. Now, I, I'd, I'd remind people that when it comes to a contradiction, we don't necessarily have to resolve with certainty what the right. truth is. Sometimes we don't have the information. But a possible way of wedding the two together is at least enough, logically speaking, to remove the claim that there is an inherent contradiction. And that's just yeah, how it, logic works. Yeah, and, that, and that's the issue of the burden of proof. And, mm. uh, you know, who you always feel the burden of proof is on the other person, <laughs> not, not on that's you. That's true. But – 
On harmonization, my approach has always been, can I conceive of a situation uh, in which both accounts could have given rise to two different accounts that are different on the service and yet are relaying the same information? And that's just how we tell stories. We hmm. do not tell stories the same way. George Guthrie is a good friend of mine and teaches up at Regent now. And George always did this when he was uh, at Union University. He would in, introduce the, the problem of the synoptics. He would have two students go sit out in the hall. He, for a half hour, he would explain you know, how the synoptics were put together. And then he'd call one of the kids in and say, so tell me what happened the last half hour. And he, and he would explain whatever happened in the hallway. When he was done, George had had the other student come in and say, okay, so tell me what happened in the hallway. And it wasn't more than 15 seconds into the second student's uh, discussion that the students just started laughing and giggling. What? Because like, were you in the same hall? Huh. Were you in the hall in the same century? Um, I mean, did one of you get teleported to Mars? I mean, it was kind of like their stories were different because they saw different things, different things stuck with them. They wanted to make different points but they were it's the same half hour in the same hallway. Hmm. Both are right. They're just different. That's how we tell stories. So they didn't say he got it wrong. They're just like, wow, you no. saw this differently in different details. That, that makes sense. Right. That's a fair example. Yeah. Yeah. I think my favorite part in your book, because this is actually where I'm less an expert on, is you make this distinction between the manuscripts, kind of the Western mm -hmm. tradition, Byzantine, and the Alexandrian tradition. And this is your area of specialty. Mm -hmm. So sometimes when it comes to trusting the text or not, we just look at how early are copies and the number of copies, which right. is a simple, fair way overall to try to assess the text. But it's not <clears throat> quite that simple, you argue, yeah. when we probe into the details. What are these different lines and why does it matter yeah. to how faithfully we, we can reconstruct the text? <clears throat> Let me, let me give you a modern example. So let's say I lecture in a, in a freshman New Testament survey class. And for some reason, only half the students were there. Well, let's, let's say there were two students. <laughs> let, let, let's okay. say the other 20 skipped class. So there were two students. One was a really good student. And he took careful notes. He rewrote his notes that evening. Uh, his handwriting was clear. It was, it was right then. And the other student a little sloppier, messier handwriting, can't always read what he says. And he waited three or four days to kind of, oh, I need to write down what Mount said about such and such. So he writes it down. And then all the other students go, hey, we need a copy of your notes. Who are they going to go to? So you could have one student come to the, to, the, to the careful student and all the other students go to the sloppy students. So you have one copy here and they say you have 20 copies over here. The fact that you have 20 copies made mm. from a bad script doesn't make that number important. That's what I'm mm. getting at. That's, and that's why text that's why text critics talk about you weigh manuscripts, you don't count them. Because it doesn't matter how many copies of a defective manuscript you have. Mm. That, that just that's not a vote uh, a reason to believe it. Yeah, and, and technically in text criticism today, they don't talk about families and manuscripts, but it's kind of how I was raised and it's an easy way to get your hand around things. And that m manuscripts like the Alexandrian manuscripts tended to come from the area of Alexandria and their common characteristics are authenticity. These are some of the most accurate manuscripts we have, the least number of obvious changes in them. And they're also very, very old. We also have another group of manuscripts. Let, let, that me, came... let, me, let me jump in before we move. Yeah. They're, they're old and preserved well because Alexandria is in Egypt right, and has right. conditions that lend themselves to preserving ancient documents well. Yeah. Is that a part of the story why we can trust oh, yeah. these? Oh, yeah. I mean, Sinaiticus is, is fourth century. And so it's, uh, it's much closer to the events than uh, like the Byzantine that we'll talk about in a second. So okay. you have, you have, they were discovered more recently in the last hundred years. Um, Sinaiticus was, was founded at St. Catherine's Monastery in Sinai, hence Sinaiticus. Mm. Um, but it's, they were, in fact, when you date them, they go back way, way before uh, the other manuscripts that we had. You know, when you think about when Erasmus, when he did his Greek text, that's the basis of King James, basically, he was dealing with 11th century manuscripts, manuscripts wow. that they themselves had been copied 
over a thousand years after the event. Now, all of a sudden, you've got Sinaiticus copied 400 years after the event. And so there's a natural tendency to trust the older manuscripts. But again, it's more than just the age. The, the scribes in Alexandria, one of the, the Alexandrian libraries, one of the ancient wonders of the world, uh, they were known for careful copying. Hmm. The, another set are the, are the Western. And as, you, as the church expanded west towards Rome, um, it's they needed Bibles, but th- sometimes we call these the missionary texts because take an example. Let's say you went to a place uh, that had never heard of the Bible and didn't have any church background, and your goal was to evangelize them. Would you take uh, an N- I pick on two here? Uh, pick an NASB or an NLT, a New American Standard Bible or a New Living Bible. Well, you would you would take the New Living Bible. Yes, the New Living is a little more expansive, uh, a little more interpretive. All translations are interpretive. The NLT is a little more interpretive, but it's understandable. And that's what you would tend to use. When I was pastoring, we had uh, outreaches. We used the NIRV, the reader's version of Hmm. the NIV, because it's at a third grade level. It's designed for people who basically are learning English as a second language. Where our church was, there were a lot of Russian immigrants. I'm not going to give them an ESV kind of Bible. It's too hard for them to understand. Well, that's what happened in the missionary text, the Western text. And that's why you mentioned earlier, Acts is 8.5 or something like that percent longer in these manuscripts. Why? Because they're expanding them. They're explaining them. They're, they're conflating stories to make sure they get all the facts right. I mean, there's all kinds of things going on in an attempt to make them understandable. And so the Western text is not considered very reliable, even though there's quite a few of them. And then what happened eventually, you got the Byzantine text when uh, Constantine legalized Christianity. He had Eusebius write 50 copies of the Bible. Maybe that was the beginning of the Byzantine text type, but these again are ones that are a little more expansive. You know, this type does not come up by, by prayer and the Byzantine text adds and fasting. On the exorcism, the disciples couldn't do. And, you know, you have the longer ending in Mark. You have the story of the woman caught in adultery. You have, for that is the kingdom of the power and the glory for us. See, these things, if you look at the earliest manuscripts, none of those things are there. Mm. Uh, In fact, we often talk about uh, the 17 verses missing from modern translations. Well, they're not missing. They were added hundreds of years later, but they were put into the Byzantine text. And then when the... uh, when the, uh, Bi- the, the the Byzantine Empire was overrun, uh, the Greek scholars fled to Europe, and they had already made a lot of manuscripts. They continued to make a lot of manuscripts, and those are what we call the Byzantine. So it's a longer exp- explanation you may have wanted, but yeah, there. So those are the different text types, the different families. Oh, that, that's really helpful and fascinating. Let's go back to the difference between the Western tradition, and I think you said the Alexandrian tradition or the Byzantine, correct me, where there's the 8.5% difference in length yeah. of the book of Acts. One interpretation of this, I guess if I were a skeptic, I'd push back and I'd say, look, see how these Christians handle the text. We mm-hmm. think They think it's the word of God. They care about reliability. They expand this thing 10%. You know, in the book of Luke, that's a couple, three chapters if you add (laughs) acts to it. That doesn't seem the care and precision of a people we should trust with a text. What would you say? I think a lot of it has to do with actually look at the changes they made. And what you'll find is that they're not destructive of the text. They're trying to explain the text. That's an act of piety. It'd be just like if, if I would read a verse when I was preaching and then paraphrase it and fill in some of the pieces, missing pieces. Um, I wouldn't do that in Bible translation, but I would do it when I'm preaching because I want the people to understand the text. So, you know, they talk about all the, the differences among the 5,600 Greek manuscripts, but a whole lot of them, well, the vast majority are unintentional and meaningless changes. But a lot of them are just, you can see the scribes trying to help people understand. So in John 5, a good example, there's a pool of Bethesda and a bunch of people lay there. Mm-hmm. Um, and Jesus goes and ta- uh, talks to the guy and says, you know, you know how long have you been here? 
you know, why are you here? Well, you know, he says, why are you here? And he goes, wait a minute. Why are these people lying around this pool? Well, verse four, uh, there an angel of the Lord came down, stirred up the water, and the first person in was healed. Now, I'm really glad that's not what John wrote because I would have trouble with that. That's just magical. I and mean, that doesn't sound like how the gospel and how Jesus works at all. Uh, but that verse was added because, and it shouldn't have been, but it was added because the scribes saw a hole in the story. Well, why are these people lying around? Hmm. Oh, there's a tradition that an angel came down. And this is one of those things that probably was originally written in the margin. Okay. And then as the manuscripts went by, it moved into the text itself. Hmm. So you, you have to look at them. I, I get asked so much when I speak on translation issues about the 17 missing verses in the NIV. And well, they're, they're missing in all modern translations. They're, they're missing because they're not original. They were added. Gotcha. But I actually did a website, missingbibleverses.com. Oh. I said, I'm just going to list these 17 verses. And as you go through, they're completely inconsequential, except for the first John mm. five and the issue of the Trinity. And the, the other ones, they're just adding in verses from parallel stories and other gospels or trying to explain things. And so I'd say, yeah, I wish they hadn't been added, but I do understand that when you're trying to share the gospel with someone that doesn't understand your backstory and doesn't understand your, your doctrines, I'm going to try to find a way to communicate with them. And I think that's what's going on in the Western text. Now, you were on the ESV translation team, right? Mm -hmm. yes. Now, I had Wayne Grudem on a few months ago just looking at his life and his experience and just yeah. the people who shaped him. It was a fascinating interview. And he's also obviously on that team and talked about the process of people voting on verses and the length it would take. But yeah. do you take – what manuscripts are you operating off? Presumably, you go back to the earliest in the Alexandrian line – What's before you that you're trying to translate to? Uh, the default text is the Nestle Elan 28, or maybe it was 27, that I'm not sure. But it's we are very fortunate that there are a group of highly qualified scholars, textual critics that have looked at the 5,600 manuscripts, some in part, some in some fragmentary, wow. have applied the principles of text criticism and have come up with a text that is so, we believe it's so close to the original that there are a few mm. places where we're not sure. We don't know whether it's Gadarenes or Gergazines. Uh, we don't know whether it's Bethsaida, Bethsatha. Uh, we don't know in places where John spelled his name with one N, one new or two, or whether it's SD or S10, two different forms of exactly the same word. I mean, there, there are questions, but the vast majority of them are inconsequential. They've been able to make the the scholars have been able to make the decisions as to what they think is original. And it's really interesting that liberal, this is one of the few things that liberals and conservatives agree on. I mean, we, we don't agree on hardly anything, but we agree that text critics have done their job. And so that's what both translation committees are. Now we know text criticism. We have the apparatus. We see where there are variants and there's some discussion about it, but it, it takes quite a strong argument to differ from that particular text. The Old Testament's a little different. The de starting point's always a Masoretic text, but there are just times mm -hmm. where the Masoretic text doesn't make sense. Mm -hmm. And if we can find a consistent um, at reading based on the Septuagint or uh, the Syriac or some of the other early translations, and especially if it involves just changing the vowels to the Hebrew text called repointing, because the, the vowels are not on the original text, then we felt comfortable, in both committees, we feel comfortable in repointing the Hebrew and bringing the Hebrew in line with the Septuagint and some of the other translations. So uh, we're, we're fortunate for the people who have gone before us. I, I appreciate that you point out just the depth of scholarship and care yeah. and work that's gone into this that can give us confidence. But also, so many Christians think the Bible was like lowered down from heaven in English, and then they discover... Yeah. We're not really sure about Gerasenes, Gadarenes, and a few other passages like shatters yeah. their faith. So this right. honest approach, at least I interpret it as honest and careful approach, I think it's actually the most helpful uh, for yeah. Christians to know as well. Handful of other questions for you before uh, we wrap up. What's the quick okay. answer? I just discovered that uh, 
one of the top, if not the most common translations that is used and bought still today is the King James translation. Yeah. Now, yeah. it's a beautiful translation. And of course, everybody who buys the King James is not necessarily a King James only right. proponent. Right. But like as simply as you can, like what would be your mm -hmm. straightforward Twitter response to somebody who says the other lines are unreliable, you're compromising if you don't use the King James? Well, first of all, I'd say, can you understand the King James? And the whole purpose of translation <laughs> is to understand it. And the per I don't know what the perspicuity of naughtiness is, but that's the King James translation in, in, uh, in, in James. Uh, the whole point of translation is to understand it. So even though it's beautiful Elizabethan English doesn't mean I want to read it and try to understand it. Uh, that's that's part of it. But the the Twitter response is the Greek manuscripts that King James is based on come out of the 11th century and all modern translations come out of manuscripts that are much earlier in that fourth, fifth, sixth century uh, with a, with many less apparent changes mm. and i'm going to try i'm going to choose a greek text that have less apparent changes than more so is it the byzantine text or the western yeah. it's the byzantine text, it's byzantine that, text that the king james only comes out of and now we have these alexandrian lines that are not only earlier but right. more reliable so do you think what if, what if somebody just used the king james without using those do you still feel like hey overall you can know the gospel it's still a pretty good translation when you say whoa time out don't use this we have many more accurate ones this is misleading bruce walkie says that all my all major translations will lead you to the cross none will lead you to heresy hmm. and i think that's true of the king james as well now uh, my family's from gravel switch kentucky hillbillies and uh, it is my cousins who are handling snakes and drinking poison okay. uh, because of the longer ending of Mark. Now, I'm mm. thankful that Grandpa left Gravel Switch, and I don't have that approach to life. So, <laughs> yeah, there are some kind of important things gotcha. in those verses when you are trying to do an exorcism. Do you need to pray or do you need to pray and fast? I mean, so there are some differences that will affect how we live, but certainly nothing major at all in how we believe. Mm. You know, when I'm reading your book, almost all of it is about the Gospels and the New Testament. And then when you get to the last chapter, it was like, oh, yeah. it's about not only a historical or a textual issue, mm -hmm. but the character of God. Right. And right. I wondered, as I'm looking at this, I'm thinking, I write books that I include certain chapters and content for different reasons, depending upon my mm -hmm. audience. Why did you include this chapter on the claim that the Old Testament God is violent and respond mm -hmm. to some of these charges like genocide and maybe one or two points that you think are significant <laughs> without going into all the depth against that charge. Yeah, I, I included it because the publisher told me I had to. <laughs> oh, okay, I said, fair enough. Wanna, That's an honest I, I answer. Wanna, I, I want to call this why I trust the New <laughs> Testament because I'm not a New Testament guy and I know someone that okay. could write that. And, and, and hopefully this book will sell well and Zonovan will see the need for doing a, mm. a more thorough discussion of the Old Testament. Um, so that's why it's there. But yeah. you're right in that when it gets right down to it, I think the most difficult issue in life is the problem of pain. Mm. And if, if the Old Testament, if you're reading the Old Testament presents a picture of God who doesn't care about your pain or causes pain or doesn't step in to stop pain when he could, then that's just a massive block. And I, I think this is actually the bigger issue. I think when people say, I don't trust the Bible because of contradictions, I think the real issue is they don't like the God of the Bible. And, and so it's, I'm really glad I did talk about that. And, you know, it, I think the old answer is the right answer, that you have to balance God's holiness that moves him to justice hmm. and God's love that moves them to forgiveness. And it's in the balance of those two qualities and what they produce that the Christian life is lived. And people who say, well, God's cruel, uh, they don't know how much he really loves them. Hmm. God loved the world. I mean, I'm reformed, but I think the world means the world. 
so that anyone who believes won't perish, but have eternal life. God sent his son not to condemn the world, but to save it. I'm, this is the message of the Old and the New Testament. And, but you have to come to a point where you, you look at what God does. Really, he exterminates every single person, parents, children, animals in the flood, except for this one family. What kind of God does that? Well, it's a God who is also just. And there is an end to God's patience. And at the end of God's patience lies justice. And what you have is an intrusion of the end times into time where the final judgment that we will all someday, uh, we'll be able to watch it. We won't, we've already been justified, but we'll be, we'll be able to see that what happened in the flood is also going to happen at the end of time. This is what happens uh, for sin. So I, I just think that's a critical issue. Mm. One of the issues and, that... and, and, and let me say, I, 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 and say this in the book, because it, it can come across being so callous saying that. We, we've had two children die. One is a miscarriage and one four hours after birth in my arms. Wow. Um, we know what pain wow. is. We mm. went through a horrible experience at a church, which was far worse mm. than two girls dying. Um, mm. this is something that we've had, Robin and I, my wife have had, had to deal with. So I don't want to sound flippant or callous. This is something we've had to work through. And you come to a point where you say, I just have to believe it, or I have to jettison the whole thing. And I can't do that. So I choose to believe. Thanks for sharing that, that heartache Thanks. that you went through. I yeah. didn't think your book came across callous, but I think Good. sometimes a short answer can feel mm -hmm. incomplete to the emotional depth and right. other issues at play. You spent your life studying the scriptures, studying the Bible. You've written this popular level book. So obviously you revisited some of these issues. You mm -hmm. mentioned the one about just dealing with the loss of two kids that I, in some ways, just can't comprehend the pain of right. that. How has your confidence or just your life been shaped by studying the Bible academically? Yeah. Has it made you more skeptical? Has it made you skeptical and confident? Has it drawn you to your knees to trust God? How does it affect you personally is what I'm getting at. I've tried to be skeptical, but I'm not any good at it. <laughs> I mean, I try to be mm. honest in my academic inquiry and saying, okay, I'm going to look at the 400,000 manuscript errors, according to Bart Ehrman. Does that bother me at all? And so, I mean, I've tried to, but my... Uh, the only downside of my academic training is that it's, it's been hard. Academics can get cold and calculating. Mm -hmm. And it, at times, it's you, you forget that the ultimate goal is to love God and love one another. Mm. And so academic inquiry can sometimes get in the way of what it's supposed to. But um, now I never really uh, had any serious questions, even when the girls died. Even when the church happened, I, I didn't understand, but I don't have to understand. Uh, there's a lot of things I don't understand Sound about my wife, but I still love her to pieces. You know, I mean, love, commitment to isn't based on understanding every little uh, piece about it. Um, but so it's, for me, this study has just been affirming. And it's, you know, I look at the arguments that are made and I try to understand them academically uh, initially. And I work through them and I just... I just don't think they hold water. Hmm. Uh, I just think for everything that's written, it, take genocide, for example, and uh, the killing of the Canaanites. Well, you know, my son came home from school that goes to a Christian school here, and he said, you know, how could God commit genocide? And I said, well, what's genocide? Well, genocide is the killing off of a race for ethnic reasons. I said, there's no genocide on God's part in the Old Testament. This was a punishment for the Canaanite sin. And the Canaanites could have, repented like Rahab. They could have they could have joined the Jewish nation or they could have left. There's all kinds of things they could have done, but they were incredibly sinful. And God's patience after 400 years had worn thin and it was a punishment. But that's not genocide. So it's when you learn the facts and, and you can see things clearly, you go, oh, that's okay. I can understand that. Mm. That does That doesn't bother me. Right after this question, Bill and I got cut off and didn't get a chance because of the audio to wrap up. But I actually think this is a great place to end with him sharing some of his personal account as how the scripture shaped him. So for those of you who's hung with me, I think his book is fantastic. Why I Trust the Bible, William D. Mounts. It's a wonderful book. 
popular level book with some depth that I would encourage. And don't forget to think about joining me at Biola Apologetics. We have a fully online program, top rated. Would love to have you in the class, Why Galato's Evil in Defense of the Resurrection. Information is below.